Welcome to The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth Podcast with your host, Chris Durow. Years ago, Chris was a firefighter and a paramedic and witnessed many people not getting another tomorrow, and it shaped who he is now as a financial strategist. Chris doesn't just help people plan for a secure tomorrow, he helps them plan for a better today. Chris lives and works in Burlington, Ontario, and runs an advisory practice named Three Hats Financial. Let's get to it. In this episode of The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth, Chris Jarreau of Three Hats Financial welcomes back Rana Shauhan, Chief Investment Strategist with the Investment Planning Council. I'm Patrice Sakora, and this time around, Chris and Rana again tackle COVID-19. Now, Chris, why don't you reintroduce Rana and explain what you really like about his work? Great. Thanks, Patrice. Well, first off, Rana, I want to thank you again for coming back on my show to give my listeners an update. Uh, I know you're obviously a very busy and in-demand guy right now, to say the very least. And I just want to thank you again for all the material you're putting out there. You've had multiple conversations with me. Um, I know you're doing webinars and, of course, (laughs) the Facebook posts. I just want to give people an idea on (laughs) Rana's Facebook posts. Rana is up at 4 a.m. each day. Yeah, I think Rana, you had mentioned you're in a global think tank with a with a medical center overseas where you're speaking to other resources and that, which is great. But you are averaging seven to nine posts a day on the markets and COVID right now, um, which I find very helpful. And I even noticed today by eight nineteen a.m. this morning, you'd already posted five. So I'm assuming you had some extra coffee in you this morning. And what I love most, Rana, about your approach is it's just a no BS, straight to the facts summary on the markets and just love the punch of enthusiasm you throw into that. So very excited again to have you. I know it's been four weeks since we had our initial COVID update for our listeners. And I know the listeners are going to be curious on what's changed. And of course, the most most important question that people have been asking is, are we in a better spot than we were four weeks ago? And we'll get to that toward the end of the show. For now, I just want to, Rana, if you can just give my listeners an idea of your background again, since they may have forgotten it from the first update, or maybe they didn't get a chance to hear it since it is a very unique background for this crisis, especially because you have, you're the chief investment strategist of IPC, but that, along with that, you have a medical background. So can you just fill my listeners in on that again? Chris, thank you again for all the work that you do as well. Okay. Uh, it's a tremendously difficult job. All right, because you're dealing with what I call the, um, the FUD, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the world. Okay, and, uh, and, and I really enjoy uh, I th- uh, seeing what you're doing, all right, and how you explain things as well to people. So I think this is incredibly important. Uh, my background was I did uh, medicine and physics uh, in England. And that's where I grew up in. And my specialization was um, high intensity ultrasound ablation of tumors. So that is basically explained as destroying tumors using ultrasound ones. And it's non-invasive, so it's not surgery. And the cost was very uh, little for it because it's basically the same kind of ultrasound you use for monitoring babies. All right, it's just high intensity there. So that's what my background was. And then I uh, went to Montreal and I uh, worked at the Royal Victoria Hospital there. And then I needed another challenge and I couldn't find anything more challenging. I know cancer is very challenging, but it's also very bureaucratic. So I needed to do it. And, and I fell in love with economics and the, again, for the fear, uncertainty and doubt around it. Uh, And I actually thought that was a better way to help people. And you can actually help more people with economics than you can actually help with cancer. Cancer, you're dealing with one hospital or the patients in that way. With economics, you can go broader. So that's why I fell in love with economics and um, became an equity analyst, uh, international equity analyst. And then we created IPC. And then we built IPC. And the foundation of IPC was do what is right, do it at the right time and do it in the right way. And that was about keeping people centric and focusing on the financial planning side and removing all the things that are uh, people make mistakes in, like their emotional side. So that's how I came into this world in this one. Well, thanks for that. That is a heck of a resume. (laughs) 
Um, so no, I appreciate that. And I've, you've been an invaluable resource for me during all of this. So thanks again. Let's start the conversation here. And I want to start with the difference of a financial crisis versus a non-financial crisis. And where does COVID-19 fall under that? And what has history shown us between the two of the different recovery rates? Okay, so there's really two types of what I call market crashes, okay? And this is where people make a mistake because they listen to TV and people start going on about, oh, this is like 2000, this is like 2008, or it's going to be back to 1929. Well, first of all, you have to separate what the actual events are from what the perception is. So when you look at things that are financial crisis, they have to do with the banking system. Because the banking system is basically the backbone of an economy. So when that shakes, it shakes the entire backbone. So when you think of the 1929 depression, that was because of bank runs. And you, you, know, you see it in that uh, famous movie, The Wonderful Life, all right, where the banks ran out of money. Okay, and that's because they didn't have the fiat system and everything like that. So whatever deposited, people would take the money out and then people didn't have money left in there. So that was that. And that's why it took 10 years to recover from. Then after that, all right, you had 1974 where you had the oil embargo and inflation went up. And when inflation went up, then people wouldn't use their banks because the, you know they didn't want mortgages and all that stuff. So banks again suffered. Then you had 2000, which was the banks lending to technology companies so that they could do all these mergers and acquisitions. So when they collapsed, it was the banks that had the problem. And then obviously 2008, where banks led, led to real estate companies. All right, so you saw a lot of things that are bank related. So that's called a financial crisis. Now, if you look at the other crises, well, they're very different. So 1962 is a perfect example. And the markets fell around 30-odd percent. And that was due to the Cuban Missile Crisis. John F. Kennedy wanted to bomb uh, Cuba because that's where Russia was. So that was great. Then you had 1969 to 1970, which was the Hong Kong flu. Again, not related to a bank. And that was a crisis. Then you had 1987, which was a program trade, not related to a bank. And now you have this one, which is not related to a bank bankruptcy or anything like that. So when you divide the markets into two parts, the crashes, bank related, non-bank related, you see a big difference. Typically, those that are non-financial stop at about minus 30 and they recover very quick, anywhere between six months to around about a year. All right. Whereas the bank ones, they fall 50 percent and more and they take years to recover, three, four years. So we are in a non-financial crisis. No bank is in trouble. Jerome Powell basically saved everybody. And that's why you cannot call this 2008. You cannot call this 2000 and you can't call this 1929 either. If anything. This is like 1987, 9-11, and more like 1969. Okay, and for listeners, if you're not aware, Jerome Powell is uh, chair of the Federal Reserve. And uh, yeah, Raina, you uh, you've mentioned a couple times um, how he's kind of the, somewhat of maybe a superhero back yes. in March 15th when he dropped the interest rates. If we had Janet Yellen, Alan Greenspan, or Ben Bernanke, this would have lasted a year to two years because they're academics, they're professors, which typically means you experiment. You do a quarter drop, then you do another quarter drop, and you see what the impact is. They measured. Whereas Jerome Powell was a businessman, and a businessman, when you're hurting, he goes right for the juggler and says, let's stop this right away. And he dropped interest rates 1%, a right immediate drop of 1%, on one day on March 15th, that would have been three to four months under any of the previous ones. So yeah, he is a superhero right now. Yeah, I've, I've been quite impressed with the difference in how quick the central banks reacted compared to 2008. Um, and we, we've had multiple conversations around that. So I definitely agree with that. Now, if this is a non-financial crisis, which we've mentioned, 
And history has shown us that usually in non-financial crises, the recovery is shorter. Do you feel that people's current level of fear around the markets is in line or heightened? And is it heightened necessarily because of the way people are getting their fixes on the, from media or how they're getting their media sources? Because you've mentioned something called clickbait, and I found that interesting. So I'll just get you to explain that. The way media used to get paid, in any business, you've got to figure out what is the mechanism for them to get an earnings. As an example, Amazon gets paid because you do a delivery and they get paid through the internet on that, right? They charge you. Or Costco gets paid from their membership fees. So it doesn't matter what they sell. They just need more members. All right. Well, media gets paid from advertising. That's the revenue generation. So in the old way, we used to watch cable TV, CBC, and we would watch it. And then there'd be an ad, you know, like there'd be an ad, a bunch of ads. And that's how they got paid. Well, with the internet model, people aren't watching TV. So the way media gets paid is they put an ad on their web page. And then they try to seduce you into going to their web page. And they do that by being extremely sensational. So they will say things like, oh, a thousand people died in five minutes. Well, you're immediately going to go, whoa, what just happened here? When really what they would probably mean is something like a thousand people died and we got the news information in five minutes. But they trapped you. And as soon as you click, you don't see it, but they got paid. So the more sensational you can make something, the more people will look at you and then you'll get it's it's called the tmz of media remember that tmz site with you know people would just make up gossip and everything this is the tmz of media of news and that's unfortunately what's happened to us is we've started and that's raised the level of fear out there and people are too easy to accept what the media is saying without having that critical skepticism in there and saying, okay, what's their angle? All right. And then figuring out, okay, Hey, um, maybe I should talk to Chris about this rather than listen to that guy on CNN who doesn't have any value at all in this. Rana Patrice here, taking that thought and then moving into the current markets. We just came off a week that was the strongest for the S and P 500 since 1974. We are up significantly from the low of March 23rd. People getting all this information and trying to make their own decisions. Do you feel that markets right now are in line with what's happening or are people just being too optimistic? Okay, so you have a couple of things going on here. One is um, wishful. um, It's it's called uh, wishful uh, drop. All right. So the people that missed out on this drop, the strategists and all the people on TV, they missed out on this recovery. So they're wishing that it happens back down again. So they put out more fear. So they're hoping that people don't invest and then you get a drop in the market, call it the dead cat bounce, all right, and then they can buy in. And it's all wishful because they missed out on it. So they're kind of trying to manipulate the system here. Well, in reality, this is part of the the whole process that Jerome Powell put in is the uh, comfort blanket to the backbone of the system, okay? And providing the bank's liquidity, providing things so that actually they've been to help along the progress. So is this gone too far, too fast? Yes, there's a little bit of that. And that's because of something called revenge trade. That is when people want to recover so much faster. This really should be two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. And that's a healthy progression of the market. Um, The way I can explain it to you, it's like us breathing. We breathe out and then we breathe in and then we breathe out again. And that's life. It's not continuously breathing out. We die. All right, so the market needs to have these little pause breakers built into it. So we're seeing a rapid recovery and we should be getting a little pause and that's good. Okay, and then it gets to the next step up. You know, think of taking steps on a stair. Mm -hmm. All right, if it was just upwards, you wouldn't be actually able to move. You'd keep on sliding down. So 
this is we're in a good process here where the, even the the bad news is being discounted faster so um, i actually think the financial virus is behind us the medical virus is still to be tackled rana you had mentioned the three waves yes so there are three waves here okay in this one here so the first wave is we got a shock wave of the virus and it's this covid-19 virus i hate i hate the name covid-19 by the way because this this is actually sars 2 so sars 1 was the first one which came out in 2003 and this is really sars it's like watching terminator 1 and terminator 2 now the overlap between the two is 99% so it's very heavily overlap sars so i hate this word covid 9 but that's what they use so that was the first wave it's the shock wave of that then the next shock wave was the social isolation shock wave you got the virus then the next is socialization is causing us to slow down on spending staying at home and then the third wave is called the asset owners wave and that's actually a little bit further on but it means that all those businesses that had to shut down because people were self isolating you know the malls and everything like that we're going to get that wave that's the third wave but all of these waves kind of end by september this year all right because if a company is going into problem they you know declare their bankruptcies or they do the refinancing and by september we're back to normal so there are three waves and they're all connected in a way all right and that's kind of like the three wave scenario but rano what if we see a resurgence in the virus uh, uh, yes you will all right so first of all absolutely you will because of the way the virus progress the vi- virus is non living it only lives when it's inside of you all right so this is why isolation is so important but there are people who are just very very dumb and they want to go on the beach in miami or in florida and they want to congregate and they're going to still spread it so there's going to be a lower level inside it the good thing is by around about september and they will hear a lot of vaccine talks and that'll help so there is a second wave the good thing about the second wave is the first wave allows the people that survive this to build strong antibodies so in your body you have these white blood cells called b lymphocytes they're like the detectives of your of your body so they recognize this uh, virus and then what they do is they take a snapshot of this virus they take a a mug shot and then they put it on the wall so the next time this virus comes in they say hey look that's a criminal let's attack him right away so the second wave is always lower than the first wave because we built some natural immunity immunity, immunity to this but some people are very stupid and the second wave is going to be much harder for the older people because their immune system is not so yeah we need to protect our seniors like crazy come around september rana a couple in the media people have been using a lot of letter analogies as far as the recovery such as is this v shaped is this u shaped is it w shaped and for listeners what i mean by that is v shaped is obviously the market goes from being at a high level to a very low level then straight back up or u shaped is with a bit of a delayed bottom. Now no one can call that exactly, but my question is are we even in the valley of e- either of these yet? So this is actually, you know, people want to uh, make it like so you can understand an L is that it never recovers. Yeah. Okay, so we're definitely not now. A V means it recovers very very fast. and i think there has to be a pause on that and a u means that there's a, a line bottom there's a little bit prolonged bottom then it goes straight up i if if i had to look at it you know based on the other previous ones and i'm particularly looking at 1969 which was based on the hong kong flu by the way hong kong is right next to china you can take a v and a u to get together so think of it as a v but the u side of it is a, is a the the other angle of the v is a little bit longer and a little bit separate so it's not quite a v it's a combination of a v and a u and nobody's come up with a word for that yet how about a square root 
<laughs> that's pretty good actually i like that one a lot better a yeah, square root kind of makes more sense on it yes we'll take that one because i think people can understand square roots yes absolutely so that's what i would say and it, it, it's usually markets go down an elevator and they go up the stairs is the best analogy i've heard okay and now in regards to, i was listening the other day in, in regards to of course a lot of people are questioning or asking about vaccine right now I know I was listening to you before. You said there's around 70 companies now working on this, but you had mentioned there was three that were a bit farther along than the others. Can you just explain that or touch on that? And plus the the big benefit of the increased, how much faster the test results are as well too with the new testing methods. Okay, so there's a lot of things that have been happening in the background on vaccines. I am extremely impressed with how the world gets together and is sharing information. Okay, this is a very impressive, but this actually comes back down to something in 1700. All right, or actually, yeah, something in 1700 called Adam Smith's Invisible Hand. Adam Smith is a father of economics, and his whole thing was when the world gets into trouble, people get together to solve that problem. And we saw that in World War II and World War I. Well, we're kind of getting Adam Smith's Invisible Hand now with this pandemic. So... Uh, initially, what happened is that uh, two weeks ago, there were 80 companies doing the viruses, uh, you know, the vaccine development, and then 10 of them failed. So now you have 70. So what you're going to hear is every single week, it's going to be more of failing. And then you're left with the stronger ones. In the end, you're going to be left with about 10 companies. And they're all going to work together to have these drugs. And some of them are very strong. Some of them are already in phase three. Phase three means human trials. That means they've done animal testing. They've done all the other testing, ready to go with humans. And that's typically about 50 days. But what some companies have done, and I thought this was brilliant. All right. I can't give the names of the companies because then you're kind of promoting a stock or something. But one of them started the production of the drug while the testing is going on. And the reason they did this, so when the test finishes, if it finishes well, that drug is already available the next day. The vaccine is. But if it fails, then they're saying that's the cost of our business. And that was an acceptable cost. This has not been done before. So you're seeing a streamlining in processes on getting the vaccine out. So this tells us if 50, if we take 56 days as a typical human trial, all right, so we're sitting in around about, you know, middle of April, so 56 days, let's call it two months, so April, May, June, then they'll talk about a little bit more testing and going through, so July, well, we could have a vaccine by August, and that's perfect. And, and the other thing that was said that people didn't pay attention to is the U.S. administration said that they want to go back to normal with a big bang. Now, big bang is cold word for July the 4th. Because think about it, July the 4th is the biggest celebration of the U.S. So they're going to have big fireworks. Well, wouldn't you like to have a successful July the 4th? It's going to be so sad if this is July the 4th and everybody has to stay at home and all we watch is video pictures of fireworks. So for that to happen, he has to start one month minimum beforehand that people can be out of isolation. And this is why you're hearing them talk about isolation is going to start, you know, we're going to get out of isolation starting next week. In fact, Germany stops its lockdown starting Monday. And that I thought was very incredible. So, you know, you're going to start to see this talk about we're out of lockdown, stage lockdown reduction, and the real preparation is for July the 4th, all right, when they, you know, they'll be able to go and celebrate it. And that was what the code word for Big Bang was. So we don't really hear these good news stories in um, the media as much as we think. So I think actually, yeah, I think we're going to be pretty good with all this lockdown. We've learned a big lesson. The huge lesson we've learned that we didn't learn in the other viruses is how much social isolation matters. Okay, well then let me touch on that because that that sounds good. We've touched on positives and also some negatives. So then the big question, start with a yes or no, are we in a better spot than we were four weeks ago when we had this conversation? 
Yes, we are in a best of one because the medical community has gotten together and the speed of vaccine development has improved. The FDA approval process has been much faster. Okay, so I think we're in a much better and there is less uncertainty now. All right, remember that FUD, F-U-D, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There's still a level of fear, but uncertainty is clearing up and doubt is being removed as well. I think we are in a better position, but it's not all clear. And because I think that third wave of um, asset owners, all right, uh, landlords, banks having problems and suppliers, that's a lot slower. And the travel industry will also be slower. So it's not all clear, but companies that do well right now will continue to do well afterwards. Okay. Well, thanks. No, I appreciate that. And that's obviously, that's the biggest question. I've had that asked a lot over the last couple of weeks. What can listeners do right now then? Is there anything they can do or just oh, stay the there, course, hold tight? No, no. This, I think uh, Winston Churchill says it the best. And he says, uh, basically, it's summarizing as, you know, don't waste a crisis. All right. A crisis is an opportunity. And we don't exactly know where the end is, you know, still some, okay, maybe, the, you know, they'll be able to pull it down or something like that. And I said two steps forward, one step back. But I think the biggest powerful tool right now is going to be dollar cost averaging. And this is where, Chris, uh, you're going to matter so much more because it's not just dollar cost averaging on its own. It's dollar cost averaging within your risk profiles. And it's not blindly putting it into anything. Think about it. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to buy a bunch of airline stocks or a bunch of uh, cruise stocks or because they hit the most or a bunch of oil stocks or railway stocks, right? Well, there's going to be some industries that come out better and some industries that are going to take longer. I think this is, I think the most powerful thing people can do right now is understand the power of dollar cost averaging because a year from now, looking back, they're going to wonder why they didn't do this. And, you know, they're going to look back. So it again comes back to that financial crisis, non-financial crisis. There was a study done which in a financial crisis, even two years later, they were negative. But in a non-financial crisis, two years later, the markets were up a minimum of 30%. But only if you took advantage of it. So that's where dollar cost averaging comes in. Okay. And for my listeners, what dollar cost averaging is, if you don't know, is that's just simply instead of taking a lump sum and trying to time the market and expose it right away it's taking whether it's bi-weekly or monthly amounts and just setting a schedule having that put into the market regardless of what's happening very good advice rana thank you very much for that is there anything else you want to touch on i think that's pretty good I, we got through quite a bit and it just it was a very good recap and summary of where we left off four weeks ago uh, what i would say is um please don't get carried away with the the fud there is a lot of value to advice right now. And one of the dangers of what's caused this crisis is that search for cheapness. We kept on hearing about how, oh, you know, low cost this, low cost that, low cost. And the problem has been that because when you lower the cost, you're giving up a safety factor. And I give the example of a car. All right. So you can have a cheap car because you don't really need the airbags. They don't work all the When I'm driving, they don't work. So it only has an accident. I'm a pretty good driver. That's what people say. And then you need it. So you can, you don't really need seatbelts either. Really, do you need brakes? And who needs a metal body? Let's put fiberglass over it. Well, you just cut the cost of a car. And in normal environments, you're fine. It's only when a disaster happens that you're so glad for that airbag, so glad for that seatbelt and everything. And those are costs. So in this search for cheapness, We've created a lot of problems in the financial world. And the same thing is in the medical world. Good vaccines and good research cost money. The search for cheapness, for cheaper drugs and everything like that, well, that's what's kind of chronic. Because now the cheap drugs were made in China, and now you've got all the problems of that. We need to 
not concentrate on much on cheapness, but also concentrate on what is the value I am getting for that? And do I understand what my cheapness is costing me? And that's the mind shift we have to do. Okay, well, thanks very much, Rana, for that. I really, really, we're running out of time here. I don't want to, I know you're a busy guy. I don't want to keep you any longer. Really, really, really appreciate your time again. Thanks for helping my listeners get a much better handle on this. Um, I know we were chatting before we started taping and I just had mentioned to you, we received a lot of great feedback and we had a lot of downloads on the first episode. So I know I had quite a few people reach out to me looking forward to this update. So thanks again. I really, really appreciate it. And that was good. Uh, Patrice, anything you want to add? Just one thing, Chris, how can people get in touch with you? They can just simply go to our website and there's a email contact form, regular stuff there, which is at three hats, financial.ca and three is the actual word three. So three hats, financial.ca. Thanks. Chris Duro of three hats, financial and Rana Shohan, chief investment strategist with the investment planning council to subscribe to additional episodes of Chris's podcast, the ride life, work and wealth. Use the subscribe button on this page and to share with friends and colleagues, use the share button. I'm Patrice Sikora, and let's talk again later. Thank you for listening to The Ride, Life, Work, and Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. All comments are of a general nature and should not be relied upon as individual advice. The views and opinions expressed in this commentary may not necessarily reflect those of IPC Investment Corporation. While every attempt is made to ensure accuracy, facts and figures are not guaranteed. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.